Hey, great to have everyone here. I would love to invite those of you in the lobby to come join us at your seats. Thank you so much. Before, before, I start, before we start talking about Jesus, I want, to, um, I want to say thank you. We've had a bunch of people sign up to be Roots Group's leaders so far. And Roots is our at-home way to develop your biblical depth and to deepen some relationships in the church. We learn so much better when we're in smaller groups. So we're trying to spread the church out that way. We used to do it here in the building, but it was a limiting factor. So we're, we're just all out in the community now. So we're looking for Roots Group's leaders. There's a training for all of you. If you sign up today, there's a training this Thursday at 6 o'clock at the Sunday Collab that Amber already told you about. So just a pre-warning. We could use a couple more, but we are very happy with the number that we have so far. So thank you. Next week, I'm going to start asking some of you to open your homes and host. We'll talk about that next week. Just trying to, just trying to inception you right now, okay? That's all it is. Um, I'm the proud owner of uh, an adopted family member. Her name is Donna. Uh, if you could show the picture, she's a 2010 F-350 precision <laughs> machine. And um, we came across her a few years ago and have done a little work under the hood. And she's a wonderful vehicle um, who, who, who takes our family wherever we want to go. And um, recently, well, a couple years ago, I put an air filter in, in her so she could breathe a little easier. She had some asthmatic issues. And um, so we got the air. And it's the kind that you like clean, you know, periodically. So I, of course, forgot about it until last week, and I opened the thing up, and I mean, there was, there was an entire tree of needles inside of this thing. There was a dragonfly. I don't know how a dragonfly, full size, got inside my engine compartment into the air filter, but there was a lot of junk in there. There was a bee's nest, and um, still at optimal performance, I will have you know, just for those of you who hate on Fords, but um, cleaned it out, emptied it, washed it, did all that kind of stuff, put it back in. All of a sudden, it was as if I was driving uh, a 10,000-pound race car. It was, it was amazing. Performance, torque, sound. It was, it was just, it was wonderful. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a liberating experience. The lesson that I want to give you is that uh, some things work best when they're empty. That's the point. Some things work best when they've been empty. That air filter needed to be emptied. It had been long enough. Last week, I was listening to my friend Paul uh, teach out of Philippians, which that's the series that we're in right now. And I was struck with this one concept in this attitude piece about Jesus that I wanted to explore just a, just a little, just a hint of it. We're not going to reteach the passage because my friend Paul did a great job. If you missed it, you can catch it on our podcasts. Um, but there was a concept in it that I want to, I want to just go a little deeper because I think it matters to us. So um, we're going to put it up on the screen, but I, I think it's best when you have your own Bible. So if you want to open or turn on to Philippians 2, um, I'm going to read just a couple verses out of this whole chunk. If you're using your fire Bible, it's page 1932, but we're looking at Philippians 2. If you don't have a fire Bible, that's totally fine. Philippians is in the back middle. Um, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Go a few more pages to the back. And then you're going to find it. It's in the middle of some uh, tough to pronounce names in there like Galatians, Ephesians. It's right there. It's the next one, Philippians. We're looking at Philippians 2. We'll start at verse 5. And um, so here's, here's what Paul writes to this church. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, and this is what I want to focus on today, instead of being equal to God, or instead of thinking so highly of himself, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. I want to read this again and I want to give you kind of the, the Greek version. And uh, it's, I, we didn't put it up here, but I want... It, this was originally written in Greek. That's why I say that. So he says, instead of thinking so highly of himself, he gave up his divine privileges or originally it says he emptied himself. He emptied himself. That's what I want to focus on. All of the gospel hinges on the fact that Jesus emptied himself of all the divine rights and privileges that he had. Now, why does that matter? What does that look like? He was still fully God, but he emptied all those privileges of being God, meaning the glory of being announced everywhere he goes. And, um, and all the power that comes with that, the position, being elevated on a throne, being, having people bring riches and, and gifts and all these kinds of things to him. 
the godly attributes that come with him being known as a king. He emptied himself of those things. He did not empty himself of his identity. He did not empty himself of his value, the value that he carried. And he did not empty himself of his personhood. He was still very human. And the thing, the thing in our universe is that empty things need to be filled. And so because he emptied himself of all those extra divine privileges, as a result, he took on human suffering. He took on misunderstandings by people. He took on being mistreated. He took on people's hatred. And he even took on a death that he did not deserve. That's the gospel. He was punished for our sins, but he rose from the grave by his power. So if we are to authentically follow Jesus and to become like him, we must learn to empty ourselves. In order to be filled with Jesus, let me say it a different way, we must be emptied. Like Donna's air filter, we need to be emptied of some of the extra things that get in there so that we can experience Jesus the way that we were meant to. Now, I want to I be honest with you. This makes me a little bit nervous because this is something that I've been wrestling with, but I haven't mastered yet. Like, I'm not ready to write a book about this. And, and, you, and you guys wouldn't be like, oh, Brian is so good at emptying himself. Sadly, a lot of you were like, that guy seems pretty full of himself. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. But this is the thing that, because I'm a human being, I'm working on this too. There are days I feel like, okay, I think I did fine. There are other days where I'm like, wow, I got a long way to go. So this is the thing that I'm doing alongside every one of us here. I will say the past two years, though, have been a gauntlet of learning to empty myself of myself in order to be filled with Jesus. And today, you know, there's like some obvious practical things we can do to empty ourselves that you hear in church all the freaking time. Like, come and worship, which is right, you should. You guys need to be serving, which you should. You guys should be giving, please. So there's all these things. You know this. You've heard it a thousand times. I'm not going to hit on that because I've discovered personally in my own journey, the last couple years especially, that all the practical emptiness doesn't amount to much if it's not matched with at least equal, if not greater parts of personal private emptiness. Are you following me today? What I'm saying is I want to remind you that being a Christian should trump doing Christianity. We need to do the faith. We need to, or we're not, we're showing that there actually is no depth to our, to our faith. But if you do all the things, all the worship, all the serving, all the giving at the expense of personally and privately being with Jesus, it's not going to amount to very much at all. In, in God's eyes, he's going to be like, that's great you did these things, but I don't know you. Jesus wants to know you first. It's not what can he get out of you. It's do you know him? So I want to remind you that those other things are very important. That's why we still worship. That's why we ask you to serve. That's why we invite you to give. They're important. But today is going to be more of a very personal what's happening inside of you kind of message. All right? So what can we empty ourselves from? What do we need to be empty from? I'm going to give you three words. They all start with P just because... I have to do that or I get disappointed in what my message looks like on paper. So my OCD is now something that you can hopefully easily remember. The first one is the word production. Production. And I will get to them in a minute, but the biblical example of doing it right and wrong are the uh, wonderful sisters known as Mary and Martha. But production. We live in a world, as you know, that is all about productivity. We live in a culture that is all about productivity. It's about, it's about unhumaningly, I don't, it's not the right word, but you get what I'm saying doing more than you should be able to do. And I will just say, your job may depend on your productivity. Your livelihood will depend on your productivity. But your soul and your salvation and your identity do not depend on your productivity. I need you to hear that today. Yes, if you don't do something, you won't get paid. You won't eat. But your soul and your salvation and your identity are not contingent upon what you produce. What you do does not make you more valuable in God's eyes. Now this is, this is like, this is an area I have struggled with a lot in my adult years. Um, a lot. Even, even had to work through in some, in some closed door sessions on 
understanding that my value to Jesus is not impacted by what I do and what I don't do and how much I do. This is huge for us because I've grown up in this world. I've grown up in this country. I graduated cum laude, and I'm proud to say that. And you know what? Jesus goes, that's fine. I don't care. Come on! <laughs> what does that even mean? Nobody knows. It's mysterious. But we put it on a diploma like it matters, and I wore a yellow cord when I graduated. But Jesus is like, I, I didn't. I, Bible college is on the bottom. <laughs> so, so here we are, right? I've learned early on that you got to produce. This summer, I had a month off. I sat right down. No one asked me to do this all the things I want to accomplish on my month of rest. Do you see the problem? Is anyone seeing the problem here? I got halfway through my list, no rest and relaxation, no one acknowledging what I have done other than me, and then it was like, why am I doing this? No one's asked me to do any of it. We, we tend to do this. Are there any other list takers in the room? Just, just think, oh gosh, I'm in such good company right now. This is wonderful. It makes me feel alive and active. This is good. However, However, if you leave your list, if you lose your list, Jesus is not going to quit loving you. Please hear that. Write it down. All of, you're writing a list. You already had it out. You know you did. <laughs> so just right next to what I just said, put it in there. In fact, in order to follow Jesus, we actually need to learn to die to ourselves, which is an unproductive thing. I can't imagine being less productive than being dead. Can you? And so, and I will read you the Bible verse that this comes from. It's from Luke 9, 23 and 24. Give me a second. It's on page, if you're using your fire Bible, it's 1576. But Luke 9, this is important because right after Luke 10 is Martha and Mary. We're going to look at them too. But Luke 9, uh, 23 and 24. Then Jesus said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up, a.k.a empty, and some translations say learn to die to yourself, but you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, Jesus' sake, you will save it. This is, this is him saying, look, you're going to do everything you can to produce a life for yourself. You're not going to make it. We can't, we cannot work our way into eternity. But we will enter into a moment where there is eternity, and if we have learned to give up our life for Jesus' sake, then therefore we get to enter into his life for us. This is huge. So Martha and Mary are those people that, that they totally personify this. And they're two sisters, if you're unfamiliar with the story. And if, if you're already in Luke 9, just flip over a couple pages to Luke 10, and it's at the end of the chapter in verse 38 where we see them. Martha and Mary, these two very different people, they're sisters and, and they're friends of Jesus. And so Jesus is at their house. And Jesus is doing what Jesus says. He's sitting around talking and everyone wants to hear what he has to say. Everyone but Martha. And Martha is the Brian in this story. Martha is like making dinner. And not, not like that I'm like this. Brian is the one who's making lists. So this is, a bad, this is a bad example. Martha is the busy one. She's getting everything ready. She's got a bunch of things going on the stove. She's making sure everyone has a seat to sit on, that there's a good playlist playing on the Apple TV. She's doing all that kind of stuff. The home is clean. That's Martha. Martha's getting it all ready. And then Mary is just sitting in front of Jesus, just listening to him, getting all the fun time. And so Martha gets irritated, and she's like, Jesus, will you tell my sister to come help me? And, you know, that's passive aggressive, just so we're clear on that. When you do that to your husband or wife later, you're being passive aggressive. You can just say, Mom, I need your help. Now, like that kind of a thing, you can do that. <laughs> Jesus answers Martha and he says, she's picked a better thing. So I'm not going to take that away from her. Does it irritate you? Does the American in you get so bothered that Jesus was so lazy? That he sided with the person who wasn't doing anything? Doesn't it kind of bother you? Like, are you kidding me? She's working her butt off and he doesn't even thank her. I mean, those ribs aren't going to cook themselves, friends. Chow mein just does not appear fully cooked and delicious on its own. You've got to get it there. There's got to be a Martha in this situation. And those things are good, and Jesus acknowledges it. But what she did, Mary, she paused. She did not worry about producing. And she allowed her soul to be filled by Jesus' words and his teaching and his presence and his love, his relationship. She had to empty herself of, I need to help my sister. She probably knew, 
I mean, I can just sit here and Martha's going to take care of it anyway because that's how we are with our siblings. Couple, uh, so we got into snowboarding. Now, if you've been here long enough, you know that I can't ski. It's a dismal failure. It ends up as a viral video when I try and ski. But snowboarding, I can handle quite well. So I have this snowboard backpack. It's bright orange so my kids can see me from a mile away so they know, okay, dad's still up and he's alive. You know, we don't got to get like the traction splint out and help him with his hip. We don't got to do that. So I wear the orange backpack because, you know, for location services. And so I grab the backpack out for our last trip and I open it up. And I mean, there's like a history of things in here. Like it's, you know, I took it through EMT school a few years ago. So I'm pulling out like, oh, this is another thing I got to work on. I got to file this paper. There's all kinds of old work in there. I swear I found like, uh, like, a, uh, um, like a granola bar from like eight years ago. There was like a, a note from Monica from fourth grade who like said, you're a jerk. Like I was like, how did all this get in here? And it's just all this stuff. And I open it up and I'm like, I'm trying to just go snowboarding. But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, but I got to do this. I got to take care of that. I forgot to file this. I need to apply for this. Like all these different things. And it was like, sometimes we do that. We, we, we are reminded that there's all these remnants of things that you were working on and you have to do and you have to get done. And it almost got to the point to where I didn't go on the trip because it was like, do I do these things or do I go have fun with my kids? Well, I got these things stacking up and we make the things more important. I left it. I emptied everything out of the backpack and was like, who cares about all this junk? It's been three years and don't eat the granola bar because you'll die. So I didn't care. Like we have to do that sometimes. The question I have for you is, what do you got lingering in your backpack? You roam across it in your purse or in your backpack or in your car? Because really, we hide everything in the car. Underneath your seat, you know, there's like your survival kit. There's like a lunch from eight days ago that you should never touch. <laughs> there's like, there's receipts. There's taxes from four years ago. It's all in there. What are those things that when you, they pop in your mind, they pull you down that production side? You've got to do this and take care of this. Or if you don't, you're a failure. First, and really, when I look at the backpack, this gets filled with previous expectations and previous pressures. Those expectations and those pressures get in the way of you being able to just be in the presence of Jesus. So I bring it up because the first thing that you've got to be able to empty yourself of is all that outside pressure and expectation that we typically put on ourselves. Because once again, those things get in the way. The second thing, so the first is that production idea, that you have to produce more or you don't have value. The second thing is punishment. Now, punishment, this is self-inflicted punishment. This is, the way I like to describe it, it's pain that's cooked too long. Something happened to you, something hurt you. You might have done it, it might have been done to you, but you have hung onto it for so long that now you bring it up. No one prompts you but you bring it up and you dwell on it and you think about it and you are now punishing yourself from this situation that you may have not done anything to deserve, to earn. It might have just happened to you. Pain is not the enemy, even though most of us attempt to avoid it like it's the death of us. Pain can actually be a great teacher, but it is a horrible master. When it becomes our master, we follow its lead, and we interact with the world through the lens that it gives us. It alters our mindset when pain has become our master. Mastering is different than teaching, because when pain masters you, you don't get a say in what your life is becoming. And oftentimes your narrative becomes more, well, because of this, because this person did this to me. That's the way I am. I am like this now. There's no changing it. And if you could hear yourself, what you're saying is, I don't have responsibility over my life because I am slave to the master of this pain. And I am believing it and I am punishing myself each and every day as a result. Pain as teacher says, oh, that hurt. That was terrible. But I learned some good lessons. I'm not going to put myself in that situation again. When I notice these things, I'm going to say something. I'm going to speak up, even though that might not be my personality preference. It's not, it doesn't always have to be like this. That's pain as teacher versus pain as master. Um, I could talk a lot more about that. I'm not going to because this is what we're trying to empty ourselves of. But in John 4, Jesus is 
He's in, uh, he's in another territory called Samaria, and he's interacting with a Samaritan woman, and I would invite you to read this encounter later. Um, the Samaritans and the Jews, Jesus was a Jew, they had this long-standing relationship of hostility and pain. Most of the Jews were taken away in exile. Some remained behind, and another, con- uh, another culture came in, and the Jews that were there that, that married with that culture became known as Samaritans. So when the Jews came back from exile, they considered these homegrown Jews, Samaritans, half-Jews, and they were half-breeds in their mind. It was total racism. And so uh, they had this hostility and this feud amongst one another. And, it, and so this woman is speaking out of pain when she speaks to Jesus. She's assuming, first of all, why would you even speak to me? You're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. Don't you hate me? That's speaking from pain. Like if I was wearing a Seahawk jersey and you were wearing a 49er jersey today, one of us, you, would be talking to me like you're better than me. Even though I swear my team's record is 1-0 right now, so I don't know where that's coming from. And no, I don't need to talk about any former year ever. We don't ever need to bring up the past. Why would you do that? Yeah, it's wow. <laughs> it's wow. I'm coming right at you. A little whoop the woo there. Put it back on you. So it's like that. It's just like that. Jesus is just at a well minding his own business. And she's like, you know, we got Sherman now, don't you? Like that kind of stuff. Who cares? So, but she does speak from this mindset of old pain and old punishment. We can't even worship where you guys worship, right? Because we think it has to happen here. Because you won't let us come over there. It's that kind of an idea. These are the things she's bringing up to him. But Jesus teaches her that all of that can be different than the master of pain has been leading her to believe. In fact, her own village treated her as a harlot outcast. But Jesus spoke to her as a human being who had value and who had worth. We put the labels on each other, like your team is inferior, or your, your dreams are inferior, or your career is inferior, your performance is inferior. We do that. We shouldn't, but we do. Jesus does not. He says, I don't care what they say about you. I know who you are. And I know who you will become. And if you follow me, I will help you get there. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus. Imagine what lessons he can teach us about our pain. But in order to embrace those lessons that Jesus has, we need to empty ourselves of our own tendency to punish ourselves and let pain become our master. None of you are expected to be perfect. You're going to make at least one mistake in your lifetime. It's a given. Since that's the standard, you don't have to let pain become your master. I brought this Christmas tree because it represents Christmas. (laughs) That's a good segue, wasn't it? Every year, my wife, I think she's the greatest decorator in all the world. She makes her house look incredible. And we store, I, I am the one who is the putter away and take her outer of storager of Christmas decor. But Andrea is the one who's got the vision to make it look great. So I learned, I hate packing the trees up in the, in the bag. And then you got to like fluff. I don't like, that tediousness makes me want to quit Christmas. So I, I learned a life hack. You just put them in the storage shed fully upright. Just leave them. Now herein lies the problem. And this is the month that we know of this problem. Has anyone noticed the spiders everywhere? Turns out they love Christmas trees. I know this because when I grew up in California, we would cut down our Christmas trees from the outside and we'd bring it inside. The year we did it, one year we did it, I was in college, and uh, my mom almost died because we brought in a nest of brown recluse. It's a venomous spider. We didn't know. We just were like, that's a cool looking pine. So, you know, eight foot of gloriousness, like right here in the living room. Mom almost died legitimately, like neurotoxin, that kind of a thing. She didn't. She's alive and well years, years later. Uh, But my friend and I literally were turning over couches trying to figure out what got my mom and it was like dead spiders everywhere because this 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 uh, that brown recluse she was she was a busy huntress. There were dead spiders everywhere. She was just nesting all over our living room. Dangerous. So so that was in California. Our house we run it a little differently. So what I do I leave the trees up to bring all the spiders you know to like come and live in here and then what I do the week before I bring them into the house I set off like 5,000 bug bombs. Just, just fumigate the whole storage shed out. Because I don't want to bring death back into the home. I did it once. Um, it was more on my dad because I was living under his roof. But still, you know, that's what you do. So I bring that up because some of you, this is you. This is your life. 
and you've got some deadly venomous spiders nesting in there in the form of the pain and the punishment that you've been, you've been bringing up constantly. If I hadn't done this, they wouldn't have done that. If I, you know, and you've, you've now, you're listening, you've got the mindset of pain. Life is always going to be miserable. You, all that kind of stuff. And what I'm saying is what venomous things have you been lugging around? What punishments have you been lugging around that you need to empty from your life? What unchecked anger? What bitterness? What grudges? What judgment of other people? Why do you keep judging them? What, what are these things? Those would be my venomous spiders that are, have lurked in, in, your, in your beautiful Christmas tree of your life. What are those things? We need to empty ourselves of those things. Otherwise, they will cause significant damage to you. Significant. Here's the third one, and then I'll, I'm going to talk about what to be filled with. Um, the third one, so the first one was productivity, producing. Second one was punishment. The third one is past narratives. Past narratives. The past has a way of clinging to us like Velcro does, you know? And oftentimes the most sticky things are the negative narratives that others have told us about ourselves. And like, um, I, I, I want to read these to you. This is just out of a book that I really, really love. It's called The uh, Emotionally Healthy Leader by Pete Scazzaro. So he gives some examples of these negative narratives. Uh, this guy was an accomplished doctor. He earns a very good salary, serves on a church board, but he struggles with perfectionism and workaholicism that hurt his relationships at both work and church. One day when he was 10, he came home with an A on his report card and was punished by his father for not getting an A+. His dad sat Dan in his room and drilled him on vocab words since that is where he got two answers from. Dan's negative narrative, get it right all the time. Don't ever make a mistake. I'm sure some of you can relate to that. Allison's parents divorced when she was seven. She remembers the day her parents sat across the table from her and her brother to tell them the news. I love you and I will be there for you, her father promised. The problem came six months later when he remarried and started a new family. She and her brother rarely saw their dad over the next 20 years. Her cautious and careful approach to life is both an expression of prudence and of the negative narrative, don't trust people. Zhao's parents immigrated to the U.S. from China. They left behind their language, culture, family, and jobs to make a better life for Zhao and, their, and her three brothers in New York. They worked 12-hour days, six and a half days a week, and only had one message for their children, study, make it in America. Toward this end, Zhao excelled at school and graduated at the top of her high school class. Her negative narrative was your worth and your value are based on your performance and your achievements. In Joseph's family, there was a lot of yelling and screaming. His father had an affair at one point, and Joseph, the oldest sibling, served as the intermediary to calm his mom down. He was the peacemaker in the family. Now Joseph is a pastor. Bold move. He avoids conflict and angry people, withdrawing until the unpleasantness passes. His negative narrative is that conflict is dangerous and bad. Here's the last one. Nathan was raised in a Christian home where his dad repeatedly said to him, God has a special destiny and plan for your life. But if you step out of his will, he will judge you harshly. Yikes. So Nathan devoted himself to being responsible and productive. His narrative, God has something for me to do and be, and I better not screw that up. I read these just because they're good examples, and I would rather read you good examples that someone else wrote than try and make up my own. But we, have, we all have negative narratives like this or like I didn't read. We've all heard something, someone has said something or done something that has, has it imprinted this idea on us that we are less than and that it kind of, it becomes a boundary in the way we relate to others. And when we identify a negative narrative, we need to take it to Jesus. And what I have found as I follow Jesus is that he will bring you face to face with these things. Because here's the thing, Jesus doesn't care what other people have said about you. He doesn't go to other people's blueprints for you and decide, ah, this is who I want to make you to be. He's God. He has good things for each and every one of us. He knows the path to fulfillment for all of us and the path to peace for us. Peace for us. So when someone gives you a negative narrative, like if you don't produce, you don't have value, and Jesus says, oh, you have tremendous value because I died for you already. Before you did anything, I already died for you. To the producer kind of person, that reminds me, I can't earn it. 
Jesus gave it to me before I even had a shot to attempt to earn it. So whatever your negative narrative is, God could not care less what other people have said about you. And what he will do is bring you face to face with it so that he can alter that narrative to the one that he has designed for you. Now, the question I have for you is, which one do you want to believe? We believe a lot of lies about ourselves. We really do. For some reason, there are people we won't even speak to, but we believe the things, the negative things they have said to us. And yet God gave his life for us. He invented humankind. He is the most caring, loving entity in existence. Why is it that we struggle to embrace the narratives that Jesus has for us when we believe things that people said about us that we never even want to, want to talk to again? So that's why I say we need to bring these narratives. Once we uncover them, we need to bring them to Jesus. A lot of following Jesus as you age is going to be you dealing with these negative narratives. I know this from my own experience and my own negative narratives, some of which God has been able to delete from my life. Others I'm still working on. Some I'm sure I haven't even gotten to, gotten to address yet. The point is, I want to make sure I say this the way I say it. God has a plan and a purpose for you, but he doesn't need to honor the narratives that he didn't write about you. Whatever someone else gave to you, if it doesn't fit into his narrative, he's not going to be like, oh, well, you know, they're really important, so yeah, let's go that route. No. There's this guy in the Bible named Peter, um, and his story is in Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, and it's on page 1464 in your fire Bible. Um, Jesus and him are having this interaction, and they're like, hey, there's all these people are saying things about you, Jesus. They're saying that you're like this guy, Elijah, or like this guy, Moses. And he goes, well, who do you say I am? You know, because essentially they're saying, they're comparing Jesus to these other men, which were great men in their culture. The problem is Jesus goes from a non-arrogant place. He's like, I'm better than them. I'm God. Now, he didn't say it arrogantly like I just did, but I'm saying it for him. So he's saying, don't compare me to these people. They're their own people. I am my own person. Who happens to be? So he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're, the, you're, you're God, which was right. It was the right answer. And so what he says, now his name at this point is not Peter, it's Cephas, which means little rock, little baby rock. Think pet rock, okay? Let's call Peter pet rock. So pet rock says, you're Jesus. He goes, yeah. And here's the interesting thing. As, as pet rock learns Jesus, Jesus then says, you're not pet rock anymore. You are now the rock, like Dwayne, the rock Johnson. Like, think nine-year-old boy with a pet rock to, like, six-foot-five, you know, million-dollar, like, headlining the rock, that guy. There's a major difference in, who Je in how Jesus saw these two individuals. Same person, but two different narratives. Pet rock was a human name. Peter was a God-given name. Pet rock was a human identity. Peter was a God-given identity. Both had narratives. And Pet Rock had a lot of negative narratives that he dealt with that we get to read in Scripture. That's the thing about Jesus. He says, I know who you are. I know who you can be. That's why I want you to be like I'm telling you to be because I know who you can be. I know your identity. So there's someone here in this room who I think needs to hear this today. It's time for you to empty yourself of these negative narratives that you have to produce or you're not valuable. That you, you need to get rid of these past narratives because someone else gets to define who you are. Or that pain is the way to see the world. I say that because sometimes when we hang on to these things, it's dangerous for us. Here's another, here's an, here's another good one. So Monday, I'm, I'm just minding my own business in my office, and Tammy's like, Brian, are you in there? Kind of urgently, and I'm like, oh, man, we got, we got a situation. She comes in holding a coffee mug, can you, mug, cup, mug. Lovely, isn't it? So... She goes, you'll never found a, guess what I found in my coffee mug. Now that's, I mean, like, this is how every epic, like, fail story starts. Guess what I found in my coffee mug? It could be anything. So the next picture, somehow a dead bat gets into her coffee mug and just dies. Now imagine, imagine if she didn't look in the cup before she brewed tea. Like her shot, like any of you grew up watching Ace Ventura 2, that's Chicago right there. Like, that is, <laughs> that is rodents. <laughs> like, equinsu ocha, blend. It is, it is nasty. Who knows? 
You can get rid of it. Let's just take it off. Her office is kind of, it's a part of the building, but it's kind of detached, right? Like, I just want to put you at ease. Everyone's looking around right now. The fans are on. We're all safe, everybody. <laughs> so we, need to, we just need to call Terminex, I guess. But the idea is when we hang on to these negative scripts, and when we hang on to these, this punishment mentality, or when we hang on to the productivity mentality, it's like brewing tea in a cup that's filled with death, like, right? Like, you got, you, got, you got that in there. We do this, though. We grow accustomed to these negative narratives, and then we count them as our identity. What they said about me is who I am, without ever consulting Jesus and allowing him to speak into who we are. And when we do that, we're drinking something nasty. We're following a path that Jesus never set us on. So why do we empty ourselves of the production and the punishment and the past narratives? I have learned that as we hang on to those things that we need to empty ourselves from, that it actually prevents us from becoming Christ-like. One of our most sacred values here in Hillcrest is that we want to authentically become like Jesus, which means we all are who we are. We have the starting points that we have. None of us are perfect. All of us are going to start in different places. It's up to God to figure that out. We teach his Bible and we teach his word so that we can, we can learn him. And, and he's going he's gonna to teach each and every one of you. And he's got you on your own path. In the process, though, we could be here in church doing all the right things. Serving, worshiping, giving, engaging, all the good stuff. But we might not be dealing with these negative narratives. We might not be dealing with this productivity mentality or the punishment mentality. And therefore, it's preventing us from being the person that Jesus really wants us to become. Imagine if Peter had said, no, 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 that's not my name, I'm Pet Rock. You get it right. Ooh, a capital P on that Pet Rock. How dare you try and change who I am? This is who I am. I am less than. I will never be mediocre. Imagine if Peter had gone down that route. I think sometimes we do that, though. We resist Jesus, not realizing we resist Jesus. This is why we need to empty ourselves of this stuff. I've found that it's like sowing seeds into the ocean. Like if I'm, if I'm keeping these things that I need to empty myself from, I'm never going to harvest anything because it's in the water. It's gone. It's going to end up someplace else. Do you know that Yeti, you guys know Yeti, the, the what are they, Cooler, the ice chest company? Like a, a boat right off, right off the Olympics, dumped containers of them, and now they're all washing ashore in Alaska. There's Yeti coolers everywhere on the shores of Alaska. Doing all of us here, no good. The Alaskans are crushing it right now. <laughs> Truckloads of Yetis. It's like that with Jesus. We're trying to grow in our relationship with him, but we're throwing it in the ocean, and it's going someplace else to someone else. We're not benefiting from it. It's poor stewardship of our relationship with Jesus because we invest ourselves in places that won't produce fruit. So what does it look like to empty ourselves? I want to give you four things to think about. Four things that you actually do need to do. Now, your value won't go up or down, but your connection to Jesus will. The first thing, this is, uh, this is another, I got that problem. These uh, QRST. Thank you. I'm very proud of this. The first thing you need to do is you need quiet in your life. And you don't just need quiet. You need introspection in the quiet. But you will not be able to introspect if you do not create quiet. Now, I know some of you, you're looking at me and you're like, I hate you. If you could get my three kids who are under two years of age to quiet, that'd be great. There are ways to do this. This is why I want you to come to lunch next week and I want you to find a buddy who might have older kids than you so that you and her can pray together and that you can have her take your kids. <laughs> or him, that's fine. I mean, I would rather, but you do you. It's your kids. Find someone. We need people here. This is a community. It's a family. We often treat our church like it's a place we go. It's not. It's a people that we are. This is family here. That's why we meet all the new people. We try. That's why we have the lunches. It's not so we can have a lunch. It's so that you can sit around a table from someone with spaghetti and meet somebody. Hear their story. Where'd they come from? You know how many people from Texas are in this room? Now, if you're from Texas, you're like, oh, there are? Yeah, there's like 40. I don't know why. This is like Washingtonians and Texans. It just is that way. The point is, we need quiet, and we need people often to help us get there. This takes some work to find and make quiet. It takes some work. Because you have to, like, turn off your notifications. 
you have, you have to turn the TV off. I need just enough white noise for me to minimize everything else, but not enough that I'm like, oh, that's a good beat. So you need quiet, you need introspection, because the Spirit speaks to us through introspection. The Holy Spirit is a very internal, internal entity who wants to speak to us through us. The second one is you need to relinquish your agendas, your plans, your own control, your expectations of what the day, what the minute, what other people are going to do, what life is going to be like. You need to relinquish those things. It's called benevolent detachment in church world, but I'm just telling you, just drop it. This is hard for me. All these things are things I love. I wake up, what's my agenda for the day? My son is like this too. Dad, what, what are we doing today? He just needs to know what the plan is. I've taught him so well. But sometimes the plans become God if we're not careful. So we have to learn to relinquish them and allow Jesus to direct our plans and our agendas. The third one is we need some spirit-led uprooting. What, what do we uproot? The punishment, the productivity, the past narrative. That's why I went into the depth I went into today. So you could take that with you. But if you take some quiet time and you allow the spirit to speak into these areas and then show you, yeah, you've, you've got a backpack full of stuff that I don't care about. It won't make you any better or any fuller. You've got a tree load of dead spiders that are going to hatch and kill you. They're going to kill your soul. Resentment, jealousy, envy is not good for you internally. You need to, you need to do a bug bomb. The Holy Spirit, pssst. let her just, let her rip. And then we need to trade narratives with Jesus. Now that's, in, that's, that's very specific. It depends on what your negative narrative was and how you shaped your view of yourself. But I promise you there's something in scripture where Jesus adds value or he adds purpose or he adds direction or he adds worth, whatever it is that your narrative is. This one is probably more conversation based than me just communicating it. All of this, the quiet, the relinquishing, the spirit led uprooting, the trading narratives. This is not just a one and done thing. This is something that you, you do, you start doing today, you make a plan to do it, and you keep doing it. It takes some time, it takes some patience. Remember, I said this before, there's no, there's no shortcuts to your depth and your growth with Jesus. God takes the time he takes, and he will take longer if necessary, but he never says, ooh, we need to fast track you. He just doesn't. Because when we fast track, we skip important foundational steps of, in our soul. I will tell you, this is, I've said for the last couple of years, this has been a journey of mine. In the last couple of months, um, it's, been, it's been a much more uh, intentional journey. And I have found, before we started this series, I have found in my own life, just of, just of working with these things, like emptying myself of these things, there has been more calm delight, which as you know, if you've been here, that's joy. There's been more joy just in being awake, just in being alive. There's been a greater comfort in myself and in what me and my relationship to Jesus is, regardless of what anyone else might say or, or, or compare it to. There's been a deeper confidence in Christ and what Jesus can do around me and in others. And then there's been a cultivation of wisdom, not saying I'm wise, but the ability the ability to spot it, especially in others. I feel like these are sweet spots that we probably want to be in. One of the main thrusts of this book is joy. So I just, I'm just telling you, as someone who's been trying to work these things, Jesus does a lot of good in us when we do this. So I would invite you. I'm going to invite you in prayer right now. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Lord, I know there's a lot you want to accomplish in each and every one of us. So Lord, I just pray that today that some of the thoughts that come out would really help guide us into who, who you want us to become. May we not neglect the important elements of our faith, but may they not eclipse the importance of these private things we talk about, like what's actually happening in our heart and in our minds about us and about the world. God, I pray for those today who are struggling with one of these three things we need to empty ourselves from. Lord, would you help them to do so? If any one of these three things that I mentioned today the, um, the production, the punishment, or the past narratives were a thing for you and you want to start emptying yourself, would you just slip your hand up? I'm just going to pray that God would help you with this. It doesn't mean these things are bad. It means that they're just too much in your life. They need a proper place. If you put your hands down, Jesus, you see every person. You know what they're living through. You know 
in greater detail than I do and probably than they do. And so, Father, I pray that as they attempt to empty themselves, that you would quickly fill them. Fill them to the place of fullness with you. May you speak to the, to the, may you heal their inner parts that are struggling and that are wounded and that are broken because of these other things that we need to empty ourselves from. Lord, I pray, I pray today that you would do that. Jesus, I pray for your touch on each and every one of us. I thank you for these people. Thank you for this family. I pray for all of your goodness in their life today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, uh, before I dismiss you, if, you've, if you're hearing this and you've thought, man, I would love to know more about Jesus and um, I would love to share that with you. So would you just come up? I'll be up here for a little while. Would you come and talk to me afterward if you're interested in doing that? Because I would love to help you with some steps on how to know Jesus more effectively because all of this hinges on that and what he did today. Other than that, I hope you guys will be with us next weekend. If you're looking to sign up to be a Roots Leader, please do so today so we can get you to our training. Uh, we got lunch next week, so I hope to see you there, okay? Have a great week. God bless you guys.